continuing on uh, this series, this basic discipleship series. And the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at the attributes of God. And this is so that as we know him better, then we will grow in our faith. We will grow in our relationship with God. But not only that is that we also are armed so that we can tell others about Jesus. We can tell others about God as well. Because if we're walking in a relationship with God, if we're walking in a relationship with Jesus and the Holy Spirit, we, we need to know who they are. And the only way we're going to find that out is through looking into the Word of God. So that's what we're going to be doing right now. We're going to be having a look at the person of Jesus. So Jesus is, <laughs> to, put it, to put no too fine a point on it, the central person in Christianity. Right? Christianity is actually named after him. Right? It's named after Christ. So he's the central person of Christianity. He's the one who died for us. He saves us. And he's the object of our worship. Everything that we are and everything that we do as disciples is always pointing towards Jesus. So he's the object of it all. You know, we have in the Bible, we've got four Gospels which are dedicated to his entire life and his death and his resurrection. It's all about Jesus. And the Old Testament predicts the coming of the Messiah, of course, points towards who Jesus is. And the New Testament, of course, was written to disciples, those who are followers of Christ. The entire New Testament, not just the Gospels, but all the letters as well, were all based around the centrality of the one person, Jesus Christ. He's referenced by his contemporaries. Did you know that? It isn't just in the Bible that we read about Jesus. Josephus mentions Jesus. We also get other letters from other people like Pliny, the younger, also talking about this person who influenced all these Christians. So we have these references about Jesus. We also find that Jesus is revered as a prophet in the Quran. So even the Quran talks about Jesus and we have other non-Christian religions such as the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses, again, who recognize that Jesus was a really important person. Jesus was in his lifetime and he still remains one of the world's most controversial figures. And he wasn't controversial because he came. And he wasn't controversial just because there was a great man who, who had some great teaching. He was controversial because he claimed to be the Son of Man and the Son of God all at the same time. And it was for that that made him controversial in his day. And the Bible is the testimony of who Jesus is and this unique dual nature of fully God and fully man in one person is the person of Jesus Christ. That's just who he is. And we need to get to know who he is. Okay, so have a look at the, uh, at the image uh, on the screen behind me and on the screens if you're looking from home as well. I'm going to give you a little bit of an art history lesson. I'm an art nerd. What do you expect? Oh. So, uh, so this is uh, an image. It's an icon. One of the oldest icons of Jesus which dates back to the 6th century AD. And it's called Christ Pantocrator, which is a Latin name for uh, panto, meaning everything, and crator being creator. So this is, this is Christ, the creator of the universe, creator of everything. This is what the title is. And you can find this particular painting, which is on a wooden board, uh, and it's in St. Catherine's Monastery at Mount Sinai in the desert. It's painted entirely in wax, uh, which is, uh, it's called, a, it's a method which is called encaustic. And it's actually uh, experiencing a little bit of a revival in the art scene right now. And if you've never seen a painting made out of wax, it, it's really incredible because it has this real life and depth to it. Uh, if you've never seen one and you want to see one, invite yourself round to Ray and Esther's because Ray's son actually paints in this encaustic method and he's got a couple on his wall. And I always look at them when I, when I go to his place. So, uh, so if you want to go, invite yourself round to Ray's. All right? <laughs> so it's made entirely out of wax. 
Uh, and this is why it's lasted such a long time in such great condition. And the reason why I chose this particular picture as a sort of backdrop to this talk is because it's believed to represent the dual nature of Jesus. It's both his humanity and his divinity. On the left hand side of the painting, uh, you'll see that Jesus is raising his right hand in a traditional blessing. That's the, the sort of the, the figure. I don't know if it's a peace sign, isn't it? The kind of. Uh, but anyway, that's a traditional sign of blessing. And uh, we can read in Ephesians 1 and verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. If you know Jesus Christ, you are an heir to every spiritual blessing. Bar none. Now that's good news. It's good news that Jesus came and he's made a way for us that we can actually enter into every blessing that God ever designed for the whole of humanity belongs to us. How incredible is that? And so we see this gesture which symbolizes that uh, for Jesus. And then on the other side, we'll see that he's out carrying a book. That's a gospel. And that is to signify that Jesus is the eternal word of God. So we see this blessing of his human nature as he came incarnate to us, but also he's the eternal word. There's this divine nature that Christ carried as well. And we read in John 1 and verse 1, right at the very beginning, he says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So here we have the eternal word, Jesus, the eternal word both with God and is God. And so we see in this painting this dual nature of who Jesus is. Now, if you look really closely and you might be able to see it from where you're sitting, you might not. People on the screen can probably see it a little bit better. But one of Jesus' eyes is a bit squiffy, right? And, and that's not a mistake. It's not because the painter was kind of like cross-eyed when he was painted, right? Uh, it's actually designed that way. It's uh, like all good portraiture. The artist has tried to capture something of the essence of the person. And he th I think that he's done it incredibly well because it's not just a likeness of Jesus. I mean, 600 years after Jesus was around, you know, without Instamatic Polaroids and all the rest of it, and uh, without Facebook, I'm not sure that the artist knew what Jesus looked like. Uh, but nonetheless, he's managed to capture something of this dual nature that Jesus has. So, if you have a look at the painting now, what I've done is I've split it down the middle and I put the two right hands, I've just mirrored the right hand side and I've mirrored the left hand side. So if you have a look at the mirrored right-hand side, that's Jesus' right-hand side, right? Because we're looking at it indifferent. At his right-hand side, we have Christ in his humanity. That's your left. That's his right. Okay. So we have a picture of Jesus in his humanity. If you have a look at that face. So the artist has managed to capture something of the vulnerability of his humanity. There's a slight upward gaze that he has on his face, that this kind of like, there's a, there's a sense of melancholy about Jesus, and it preempts this man of sorrows. It preempts that vulnerability that we have as human beings. You know, we're born into this world, not like animals who have teeth and fur and they can stand up as soon as they're born. No, we are born completely helpless, totally helpless, as was Jesus at his birth, totally helpless, lying in a manger. He was looked after in his humanity as a small baby, an infant just born, in the same way that you and I were. Totally vulnerable, totally open to the elements. That's an incredible thought. Now here's the eternal word. Here is God's own Son, God who shared in His glory, would allow His Son to be born 
into humanity to allow human faulty parents like you and me to look after his precious son. My mind boggles. And when I look at this particular painting, I see that. I see this vulnerability in Jesus' face. This is Jesus, our brother. This is Jesus, our friend. This is a very human Jesus. But then as we look at the other side and mirror that and put it together, we actually see a very different painting. We see a very different aspect of the character and the personality of who Jesus is. This is a portrait of Jesus as God. You will see that he has this countenance which has a presence about it. This is Jesus, ruler, ruler of the universe. This is the King of Kings. This is the Lord of Lords. This is the guy who's gonna be judging both the living and the dead. You don't wanna mess with this guy. This is God, this is God. And yet we find both of these portraits in the one person, Jesus. As we look at this icon of Jesus, this is theology in art and probably one of the best ones that I have come across. So what we're going to do today, because we don't have time to unpack all of who Jesus is, is we're just going to have a look at his humanity today. And then next week, we'll have a look at his divinity. So let's, uh, let's read from Matthew 1 and verse 18. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. So as we've already mentioned, here is Jesus being born. His life starts on earth exactly the same way that every single one of us does. Born as a human being. Jesus had that one exception that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. But apart from that, he was human in every way like you and I are. And the virgin birth is important. It's important for our understanding of who Jesus is and it's important in our understanding of Jesus' mission in the world, the person of Jesus and the work of salvation which he came to do. As we read about the life of Jesus, particularly around the Annunciation, which is where the angels came and told Mary what was going to happen and then told Joseph in a dream, all around that time we actually see that the revelation of Jesus coming into the world, the Messiah coming into the world, actually starts out talking about this dual nature, that this is both going to be a human being and also God was going to be with us. So we see the virgin birth because the fact that he was born of a human mother, but also conceived of a divine father, that's God, the Holy Spirit allowed Jesus to have this divine nature because he was both human and divine. And because of he was human, he could represent the whole of humanity. You know, if, if Jesus was just God, if he was just a God that descended on a big cloud and touched earth, you know, he could have still told us the same great things. He could have still been a great teacher. He would have still done incredible miracles. But just as God alone, there was one thing he could never do. He could never die on a cross for you and for me. He couldn't have taken our place on the cross unless he was both God and man. So the humanity of Jesus is really, really important. It's important that we understand that from scripture, that this isn't just an idea which was made up by the early church to make Jesus out to be great. No, it's absolutely fundamentally important because without the virgin birth, without the fact that he was fully man and fully God, he could not have gone to the cross for you and for me. So we need to understand this is really important. 
because he was conceived of the Holy Spirit, he never inherited the sinful nature. And again, that's really important too, because again, if Jesus had just been born as a man and wasn't God, well, he could represent us, but he'd be sinful just the same as you and I. And he would have been subject to the same sacrifices and nothing would have changed. We'd have still been worshiping in the temple. In fact, you and I would still be heathens. But he wasn't. He had no sinful nature. And therefore, he could represent both God and man in one person. Fully God and fully human. But he also, in his humanity, was subject to the same weaknesses and the same limitations that you and I are. When you read the Gospel of Luke, Luke, as you know, was a physician. So as a physician, he was a studied man. And he says right at the very beginning of his Gospel that he made careful study into all these things so that we, Theophilus actually, but, but us as well, that we might be able to have a guarantee that, that we may know that we know that we know the veracity of what we've been taught. So that what gets written into the Gospels, we may know it is the truth. And so he made very, very careful inquiry into talking to eyewitnesses. And one of those people would have certainly been Mary, the mother of Jesus. And if anybody knows that Jesus was human, it was going to be Mary. All right? She gave birth to him. She changed his nappy. She knew how human he was. You know, she was the one that helped him and guided him as he, as he grew up. She knew that he was human. And she shared it. In fact, the word tells us that she stored up in her heart all these things that the angel told her and all of these things about Jesus. She stored it up in her heart. And she must have spent many, many, uh, an excellent evening with Dr. Luke talking about Jesus. And I love to have been there. I love to have just sat at the table and just listened to all of those stories of Jesus. In Luke chapter 2, he says the child grew up healthy and strong. He was filled with wisdom and God's favor was on him. And a few verses later, again, he says Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature. So he grew in his intellectual faculties, but he also grew physically in stature. So Jesus grew the same way that you and I do. He was subject to limitations the same way that you and I are in his humanity. So it's no different for him. Jesus was born, grew bodily, and he was limited in his knowledge and limited in his wisdom. He had the same weaknesses that we do. Do you remember that Jesus became tired? And he used to fall asleep in boats, right? Especially when there was a there was a storm going on. You know, where was Jesus when he was needed? Well, he was curled up on the cushion on the bow, right, <laughs> falling asleep because he was tired, right? And there's the disciples getting all hot and bothered, and you know, waking Jesus, Jesus, why don't you save us? Well, yeah. he was tired. He he had a human body. Same as you and I. We're not talking about a superhuman person here. We're talking about a very human man, a very human Jesus. He got physically exhausted just by doing ministry. All right? You remember uh, the story where Jesus and his disciples had been ministering and they go into Samaria. Right? And he goes and he finds a well to sit at. Well, the Bible tells us that he went and he sat down in the well because he was exhausted. He got tired. You all get tired. We all get exhausted. We all know what that's like. And we all know that last thing we want is somebody coming along asking us a whole bunch of questions when we're tired and we're exhausted. Well, thank God that Jesus wasn't sinful like you and I because his response was very different to the way that mine would have been. When I'm exhausted and tired and my kids come to me and they say, Dad, Dad, they don't get as gracious an answer as Jesus gave to the Samaritan woman. But Jesus nonetheless got physically exhausted. You remember when, uh, 
when he'd been through his trial, right? He'd been up all night long, like sleep deprivation. Not only that, he was being grilled by the temple authorities and then by the Roman authorities, he'd been whipped and now he was forced to carry his cross. And we read in one of the accounts that he collapsed on the way to the cross, on the way to Calvary. So that the man who was standing near him, Simon of Cyrene, was told by one of the centurions, you pick up his cross because we got business with this guy. We have to crucify him and he's not going to make it if you don't carry his cross for him. So Jesus bled the same way that we did, hurt the same way that we do, got exhausted the same way that we do. Jesus became hungry and he became thirsty. You know, when he was in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights fasting, it says at the end of it, and he was hungry. Right? <laughs> it's like, of course he was. 40 days without food. Jesus got hungry. He was looking for food. And of course the enemy came along and tempted him with loaves of bread. And we know the rest of that story. But on the cross as well, when Jesus is hanging there on the cross and he is coming near to the very end, he said, I thirst. And of course they put a, a sponge on a hyssop branch and they held it up for him to, to bite down on so that he could wet his mouth. He thirsted, he got hungry, tired, exhausted. In his humanity, Jesus was no different to you and I. He suffered the same things that we do. You know, during his life, there was absolutely nothing that would have made Jesus stand out to be any different from you and I. You know, when he was in, in Jerusalem, when he was walking around uh, the land of Israel and ministering to the people, they had no issues whatsoever with his humanity. None. If you remember when he was when he was went to his own hometown, right? It says that he couldn't do any miracles there because all the townsfolk, well, they remembered what he was a boy. They remembered that he was a carpenter. They remembered what he was like. They remember catching him, throwing chisels at, at, the, at the wooden board, right? But they, he, was, he was a boy just like you and I. Well, half of you anyway. <laughs> if he was a girl, he'd be doing something else, I'm sure. But the point is, is that in his hometown, they knew he was just a man. They watched him grow up. Some of them, sat on his furniture. This is just the carpenter's son. This is nobody special. There was nothing about Jesus, nothing about him in his life, in his humanity that would make us think that he was any different to you and I. It wasn't his humanity that they had a problem with. It was the fact that he claimed to be human and the son of God. And it was the end son of God bit that they had a problem with. And it was for that reason that they crucified him. And that alone should be testimony enough to us that Jesus was human. Because his body was so broken on the cross that he died. So this is no superhuman. This is no this is no person who who, you know, uh, was a superman. This is a very, very human Jesus that we see here. And interestingly enough, even after his resurrection, when he rose in glory and he appeared to the disciples, he showed that that resurrection body that he had was still human. It was still a human body, even after resurrection from the dead. The only difference being, of course, is that it didn't have the same limitations and the same weaknesses as he had before. In Luke 24 and 39, Luke writes at that time where Jesus appeared to the disciples and they're like, they can't believe it. 
can't believe he, he was Jesus. We saw him die. We saw him die. We saw his body being wrapped and put into a tomb. He should be dead. And here he was standing in front of them. And they thought, what on earth is going on? Jesus says to them, see my hands and my feet. This is I myself. This is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones. In the resurrection, Jesus still had flesh and bones. And Jesus invited the disciples to come and see, make a thorough personal examination and see if I'm not human. I'm not some wispy divine spirit that rose from the dead and just appeared like some kind of hologram. This was a real flesh and blood Jesus that rose from the dead and appeared before them just without the limitations that he had before. And you know what's really incredible? Is the fact that this resurrection body that Jesus has, this humanity that he took upon himself when he came to earth, in the resurrection, when he ascended into heaven, he took that same human body with him into heaven. Jesus still has that same resurrection body that he had three days after the cross. You want to blow your mind? God took on humanity and humanity has now been subsumed into the Trinity. Forever, Jesus is human in resurrection form. Stunning. Like, honestly, I could just sit here and think about that for the next half an hour, but you'd all get bored. So, when Jesus returns, good news is that we will be bodily perfected just as he has spiritually perfected us now. That's the promise. The promise of God. You know, the fact that your sins have been washed away. You have been set right with God. He calls you son. He calls you daughter. You are perfect in Christ Jesus before the Father in heaven. And Jesus says, when I come again, I'm going to make that body of yours that broken, sick body that gets hungered, tired, thirsty, cranky, hangry. I'm going to perfect it. You're going to be just like me. How good is that? You know, in Jesus' humanity, his soul, all right, his soul, which is the body, the mind, and the emotions, that was human too. That was totally human. Speaking of his own life, John reports of Jesus, nobody takes my life away from me, but I lay it down of my own free will. My own free will. I have the authority to lay it down and I have the authority to take it back again. This commandment I received from my Father. So in in his humanity, just the same as we do, we have a free will. We have the choice to come here today or not. I prayed that you would, right? So I'm kind of cheating, right? I, I, I asked the God to just bring him in. Right? <laughs> so he's working on you too. But you know what? You've got, you've got the, the free will to do that. And Jesus had free will. He had free will. Did you know that if Jesus had decided of his own free will that he didn't want to go through with the cross. Do you know the Father would not have made him do that? That was totally Jesus' choice. He had free will to obey the Father, free will to do it. And you know what? As the Son of God, if he said, I can't do it, I can't go ahead with it, then God would have said, that's okay, son. He was free to do that, but he didn't. He chose to give his own life so that you and I, undeserving as we are, might be brought into that family so that we can be where he is. 
but it was a free will choice. As we've already seen, Jesus grew in wisdom and in knowledge. So his mind grew. He had the same kind of mind as we do. And he learned things. He grew in wisdom and knowledge. But he also had limited knowledge. You know, when, uh, when the disciples asked him, what's the hour and what's the day that the Father's going to come in judgment? And Jesus said, no one knows the hour and no one knows the day. The angels in heaven don't know. Not even the Son knows the hour and the day. Only God in heaven knows. So Jesus, even in his humanity, had limitations in what he knew. When it comes to the emotions, I don't know how you think about Jesus, but you kind of we have this kind of idea that that Jesus was this wonderful, sweet guy who was just nice to everybody. In fact, Jesus was Canadian. <laughs> Did you know that Jesus was so nice? All right. I mean, he, that they'd have. They'd have given him citizenship just based on the fact that he was a good guy, right? And we kind of think that he's just this peaceful guy that kind of cruised. I mean, all right, he got angry ones, right? He got angry ones and, and kind of whipped a couple of sheep. But, but apart from that, Jesus was just kind of like, Ooh, wasn't he? Not according to the Bible, he wasn't. Jesus didn't have... sin in his life. Jesus didn't have the kind of upbringing where, you know, just things crowded on him. In fact, Jesus would have been the most well-adjusted, emotionally adjusted person that's ever walked the planet. Why? Because he knew who he was. He knew fully his identity in God, that he was the Son of God, and he didn't have any sin. So Jesus was actually emotionally free, free to be expressive. You also get so uptight sometimes, don't we? So uptight emotionally. Canadians. But Jesus, he was free, emotionally free. Let's have a look at uh, how Jesus expresses this. In Luke 12 and verse 27, Jesus says, Now my soul is deeply troubled. Deeply troubled. Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? But for this very reason I came. In Matthew 26, he says to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Have you ever been that sorrowful? Have you ever experienced that depth of emotion where you were just simply undone? Jesus did. Jesus did. That phrase, deeply troubled, means grief and anxiety. The kind of anxiety that's brought about by sudden danger. You know, when I think about this, here's Jesus telling his disciples about his last days on earth. The fact he's going back to the Father and he's going to have to leave him. And that kind of sudden understanding of a realization dawns upon him I'm actually going to die this is really going to happen it's like he suddenly this is real to him and he feels it intensely the danger of the cross the grief and the anxiety of having been pulled away from his disciples whom he loved deeply this is real human stuff that Jesus is feeling. You know, in other places in the New Testament, we read that Jesus marveled at the faith of the centurion. You know, you're only going to marvel at something if you weren't expecting it. So again, Jesus was limited in his knowledge. He wasn't expecting the centurion's faith to be like that. He was like, wow, I have never experience faith in the whole of Israel, God's own people, than in this Roman 
Incredible. Jesus marveled at that. It also says that when Lazarus died, he wept. He wept bitterly for the death of his brother. It also says that when Jesus prayed, he did so full of emotion. You want to you wanna experience a prayer time? Pray with Jesus. It says in the word here that when he prayed, he'd offered up prayers and supplications to the Lord with loud cries and with tears. That's just way too emotional for us Canadians, isn't it? Way too, you know, those emotional outbursts, really, Jesus, come on, right? Get a grip. That's not how we do it here, right? Us Anglophones, <laughs> say us, us Anglophones, you know, we grow up in this legacy of the Enlightenment, that in intelligent, educated people should be emotionally detached from what they're talking about, because that's proper. That's the way we get educated. And we generally look down upon those who are more impassioned or display passionate displays. And we say it's emotionalism. We look down upon that. But that isn't the way that Jesus was, and that's not the way that Jesus prayed. As I said before, Jesus was the most emotionally well-adjusted individual we've ever seen. I think maybe, maybe we might have it wrong. I thank God that Jesus was not an Anglophone. If you want to experience something a little bit more closer to possibly the kind of passion with loud cries and wailing, right, in their prayer times, then I would invite you to come along and pray with some of our African brothers and sisters in the city. Because boy, do they know how to do it, right, and get fully involved, body, soul, and spirit. Amazing. It's amazing and it's such a blessing. 1 John 2 verse 6. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. There are many reasons that Jesus was born, lived and died as a man. Not least of which was that he came to give us an example of how we're to live our life. You know, if, if, if there was just this divine being that floated down with a big red cape, wearing his underpants on the outside of his tights, we would not be able to relate to that. That isn't an image that we can follow. It's not even a pretty image to even think about, honestly. But, you know, we, we wouldn't be able to relate to that, but we could relate to a human Jesus one who hurts the same as we hurt. One who felt the same things that we feel. One who is acquainted with sorrow and grief. He knows who we are. He knows us in our humanity. And yet, he went through all of that without sin. And it's because of that, that we can look to Jesus as our example. We can look to Jesus as being somebody who we can imitate. And as MB, as Mennonite brethren, we have a particular focus on the person of Jesus. Is that we look to Jesus and as we read scripture, Jesus is the central figure. You know, we read the whole Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament through the lens of Jesus Christ. That's what we do. Because as we read the gospels, as we read how he lived his life, we're supposed to become imitators of Jesus. In fact, that's why he sent the Holy Spirit, so that we could be changed and transformed into his image. That's why it's important to understand the humanity of Jesus, because this isn't just some super God who is disconnected to us and disconnected to our troubles and our trials, but this is a very human Jesus who knows how hard it is when you blow it and you lose it with your kids. This is the same Jesus who knows that there are marriage issues 
And you know what? He invites you into that relationship. Because as Hebrews says, we do not have a high priest who, who isn't able to sympathize with our weaknesses. He knows you. He knows your humanity. And he's taken that humanity and that experience of what it is to be a limited, finite human being. And he took that with him into heaven. Our goal should always be like Jesus, even to the point of death, remaining faithful as he remained faithful, because he's our example. He's our example in forgiving one another, loving one another, self-sacrificing for the sake of other people. Jesus showed us how to live, and he showed us the best way to live. And in all these ways, Jesus was the model human being, the most perfect human being that's ever walked. If you want to know what humanity looks like, then look no further than Jesus. It's easy for me to forget sometimes just how human Jesus was. But he gave up that heavenly estate. He gave up that divinity and all those things that were due his name. You know, he is worthy as God to receive our praise, worthy to receive our worship. You know, he was already sitting on the throne before he ever came to earth. And yet, he said, I'll give that up and I'll come as a human being to live, to die as a human being so that we might enter into eternity with him. It's hard sometimes to remember that Jesus was fully human when we think about his divinity. And the fact that he's human forever boggles my mind. Absolutely boggles my mind. But that selfless love and that kind of humility where Jesus emptied himself of all of that for you and for me, that's worthy of invitation. That's worthy of saying, Jesus, my brother.